today we have two instructors joining us. It's like a two for one special. Uh, you can see that they have the same interior designer, Paul and Amy. So Paul Young, Amy Graham, two of our instructors. Um, uh, they're not only great instructors, but I know them both personally. They're great people. They have a ton of experience in product, leading product teams, kind of living and breathing the pragmatic framework before they joined our team. So they've got great perspective and, um, and I think we're gonna have a good discussion. Uh, Amy, are you gonna share your screen? Yep, I, oh, I'm sorry, Rebecca. I did. That's all right. It's up, I just didn't hit share. None of us ever have any issues with Zoom. We're all seamless. You might see a cat come through. It'll be very exciting here. How's that? All right. So um, again, you can use ask questions in the chat box at any time. We will be monitoring that. Um, and feel free also to introduce yourself there. And I think we have an assignment to lead off uh, our little uh, talk today. Yeah, we want everyone to take maybe 30 seconds and uh, just think about this. And again, Nahito, if you're not familiar with the term, nothing important happens in the office. We're talking about doing your market research, doing your qualitative, doing your uh, field visits, getting out there and, and talking to your buyers, talking to your users, and really understanding them at a deep level. That's what we're talking about here today. Uh, obviously, there are challenges right now going on with that, and we'd like to talk about how to resolve some of those. Uh, there's no silver bullet you know, that we can provide that will get us over you know, all the challenges that are going on with the quarantine and everything else. But some of the things we want to talk about today will put us on a more sustainable path. Um, you want to drill down to the next level, Amy? Sure. So uh, these are some common Nikito challenges, many of which you all mentioned in the chat just a moment ago. Um, but these are ones that uh, Pragmatic has collected over time. And Paul and I pulled out, uh, particularly for this discussion, thinking that they would likely come up as trends. So the first one is that we can't travel right now. Um, so with COVID, social distancing, uh, stay at home orders, there's barriers and we can't actually physically get out from behind our computer to go travel and do market research. Or outside of COVID and our current reality, maybe there's also a lack of budget. And if you have a lack of budget, that often creates a scenario where we can't travel for market research either. Uh, we don't have budget to get on an airplane. We don't have budget to stay overnight in a hotel. We don't have budget for meals, whatever that is. Um, this is a definitely a barrier that we will address for you uh, today and give you some things to think about. Sure, or maybe budget for tools. Yep. Uh, we also hear that it's really hard to access your market, um, especially now when we saw many of those pop up in the chat. You know, if you're talking to people in the healthcare space, and even not in healthcare, you know, in all these other industries that are impacted, we're all impacted to some degree. Uh, and right now, everyone is. Uh, someone used the term "hunkered down." They're really sort of like batting down the hatches, focus on the core business. You know, how do you actually access those people for research? You know, you can't just freeze your product in place, you know, in, until this whole thing is over. Um, there's still work that needs to get done. So how do we access your market even when times are tough? We'll get into that. So uh, a couple of you mentioned being buried in tactical activities. Either your customers who you want to do research with are buried in tactical activities or as product professionals, we're buried in tactical activities. Maybe we're busy uh, attending daily standups. We are creating, you know, helping the marketing team to create collateral messaging. Maybe we're prioritizing and reprioritizing. We're writing requirements. There's this laundry list of really, really tactical things. Maybe you spend 50% of your time doing demos and presentations of the roadmap. Um, at some point, obviously, that stuff will pull you away from these strategic type activities, which it, one of them is to do market research. So we'll give you some things to think about related to that. Okay. And you can't get face to face right now. Obviously, we all know why. But like, is that an excuse for not doing market research? Uh, are there ways around that? You know, how can we take the most advantage of the access we do have to do some things that maybe you couldn't even do if you were face to face? Uh, one of the cool things I think we're going to get into here is that um, there are actually some big advantages to the situation that we're in right now. And if you think of it not as a constraint, but as an opportunity to do some new things, uh, it might open your eyes to some ideas that maybe you hadn't really thought of before. Yep. And how about this last one? Uh, a couple of you mentioned this as well in the chat. So it's hard to understand what research is appropriate to do during this time of crisis. How can we, or should we still be out doing research in some respect uh, 
during this really sensitive time? And if so, how do we do this? What are some things we should think about? Um, so we will address that as well for you. Um, obviously, this is very relevant uh, right now in our current world. So hopefully we can help you with that. All right. So if you are in a situation where you cannot travel or uh, let's talk about the budget one, you have no budget for travel. Like I said earlier, uh, nothing for airfare, nothing for hotel, can't get out. Um, one of the suggestions is to start locally. So see who you could do market research with that is present in your physical area. I used to tell my product team to draw a hundred mile radius around our office location, or if we had employees who worked remotely, uh, figure out what that hundred mile radius around your home would be. See who you could go talk to, or uh, right now during this particular time who we could meet with virtually that is locally um, would work as well and start there. We don't have to travel the world initially. If you've got global products, there's this pressure to make sure you're getting a really good sample size and you're talking to people across the different geographies. But don't ever be afraid just to get started, to start locally. So we were talking about this before uh, everybody joined up today, how you know it looks like, at least here in the US, that the lockdowns are going to happen in waves. And you know one state might come off a little bit earlier than another and so on. Uh, and so airfare or airplanes might be shut down for a little bit longer. So all the more reason, right? If you were to draw that radius around your office, you can find some people to go talk to uh, in your area that's hopefully coming off of lockdown right now. Um, that's a good starting point. You don't have to hop on a plane. You don't have to find somebody. I'm guessing that for almost all of you on this call, you could find somebody that you could drive to to go talk, talk to um, as a starting point. Uh, and that's usually a good place. And what you're going to find is that as we start to come off of that lockdown, people are really going to want uh, that that touch. They're going to want to be able to be see and be seen outside their office. Absolutely. Uh, do your Nihito through technology. So um, I, I fully acknowledge and understand that several of you commented that some of your customers or people in your market may not have uh, technology or appropriate video capabilities, but whatever technology we have, we should absolutely be tapping into that right now. Doing Zooms or whatever uh, webinar software you'd like to use, WebEx, um, having the users take their video camera and turn it around and like show you what they're doing at their desk. Um, so now obviously it's even more important than ever to tap into that technology and make sure we're, we're harnessing it. So for those that don't have access to video within their customer base, what I would always tell the students I teach is that when we, when we do this ethnographic research, which is what we're talking about here, qualitative research, um, something like 70% of human communications is nonverbal, right? And when you're not face-to-face, -face, obviously you lose a lot of that. Tools like Zoom bring some of that back. But if my only choice is to do this over the phone, which I'm guessing pretty much everybody has access to versus not doing it at all, well, obviously we're gonna take the phone. It's better than nothing. So use it as a starting point, even if you don't have as such advanced technology as this, um, start there and then branch out. How about bundling your Nihito sessions together? So, um, you know, obviously we wanna be very sensitive to people's time and whatnot. And maybe now we can take three uh, of our customers and we can meet with them virtually through technology and do Nihito sessions together. It's one of the, you know, three for one type of deal um, rather than individual ones if there are time constraints or constraints on our customer side. And we can only get them during, turn, uh, during certain time frames, but we can actually have people do it at the same time. What about the last one, Paul, creating a marketing event? You want to speak Yeah, to we were brainstorming about this one the other day, and this is something that I've seen some of the clients that we've worked with do successfully, where um, like take, a, take an event like this, you know, a webinar, um, <clears throat> or some sort of uh, uh, you know, coffee talk or office hours or whatever. Maybe you want to create something like that in conjunction with your marketing team um, to pull people to it. And then once they're there, you give them something of value, like a talk, like kind of like what we're doing now. It'd be pretty easy for us to capture a handful of you after a call like this to say, hey, we want to do some Mijito within our uh, within our client base. You could do the exact same thing. The cost of doing one of these is relatively low as compared to you know, going to a trade show or something like that, but the value is pretty high. So you know, just create a very simple marketing event and then tack on some Mijito at the end of it, and you're going to find that people are going to be a lot more receptive to them. And Rich, I see your question in the chat right now. Um, so you asked, how do we get folks comfortable with sharing a video um, of them? 
So sometimes what it takes is for us to show ourselves on video, for us to be vulnerable and put ourselves out there. Um, and then sometimes that's just enough for the customers or have that conversation in advance. You know, we really, really like to observe certain behaviors or see your workspace or, um, you know, give you, the, have you uh, show us your spreadsheets that you're working with or the different tools, whatnot, and have that conversation in advance. Um, at the end of the day, you can't obviously force somebody to get comfortable with technology, but a lot of it is just starting with ourselves. And if we're comfortable with it and we can get on video, uh, then sometimes that will uh, give us just enough for the end. Paul, any other suggestions? I, I think the key there is informality, right? If it's yeah. very formal, it's very buttoned up, you know, we're looking at you and I want to like examine your workspace. You know, of course, nobody's going to want to do that, that. But hey, we're just we're just some buddies. We're having a chat. We're talking about the problems that are going on in your world. This is not super serious. This is something we do all the time, right? People are gonna be a lot more open. <clears throat> we, we've learned a lot about getting people to turn on their video um, here at Pragmatic when we teach. Um, and you'll notice that slide we stuck at the very beginning of the class asking you to do just that. Some of you did, some of you didn't, but thank you for those that did. Um, don't discount in group settings the uh, power of the icebreaker as well. Uh, where you talk about something that isn't necessarily related to your research, but just like, you know, I, I like to ask people, give me a restaurant recommendation in your city so that when I come there, I can figure out where to go eat because I don't eat at hotels or chains. And so usually that like kind of starts the conversation. A lot of you expressed uh, a barrier or a challenge around getting access to your market. Sometimes this access uh, or this barrier rather um, can come from sales. So they put up this barrier and say, uh-uh, you're not talking to my customers. Uh, if any of you have experienced that, um, we'll talk about a couple of related things such as getting buy-in and that sort of thing. But one thing you can do just initially right off the bat, if your sales team is giving you pushback and they're creating a barrier uh, for you to get in touch with uh, current customers or people who are in your pipeline, what we would encourage you to look at are your potentials. So for those of you who have attended pragmatic classes, uh, particularly the foundations course, if you remember, we show you this pie chart. And within in that pie chart, there are three subgroups to your market. So you have customers, either your customers or your competitors' customers. You also have evaluators who are people that are shopping. They're actively looking for a solution to the problem. And then you've got a subgroup called potentials. Potentials are people who we assume have the problem. That's why they're in our market segment and we have them included in our market sizing activity. However, uh, they have not started shopping. They're not actively looking for a solution. So if you're getting this barrier thrown up from your sales team about talking to your current customers or people who are in the sales cycle, we would encourage you to go look at the potential group. They are free game. They do not have a product in that category yet. They are not shopping and you do not need permission to go chat with the potential. So start there. Yep, that's a great point, Amy. Sales don't care about potentials yet. They're not shopping. Once they start to shop, sales will care about them a lot. But for right now, that's the domain of product. You should be talking to them. Um, if sales continues to throw up a barrier, and, and by the way, we're not against sales. Sales is our partner in this. We want to make them our partner. We're not here to bash sales. But if sales is continuing to throw barriers to your access to those parts of the market, um, there are what I refer to as escalating levels of jerkness that I go through in order to get sales to not want to come. And so the the main thing that you're going to want to do is if sales insists on going with you to those meetings, you don't want them there, right? Because if sales is in the room, it changes the tenor of the meeting, makes it a lot less productive from a research perspective. And so what I teach people to do is bring your salesperson with you for the first couple of meetings, but make sure, 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 sure that the first couple of meetings you schedule are with users of your product, not buyers, users, users only. And Get, get on your Zoom meeting, talk to your user. You're doing all this research. This is great. Your salesperson's on the Zoom call as well. After about five minutes of talking to this user, look over at the video feed from your salesperson who's now going like this, right? About five minutes after that, they're doing this and they're on mute, right? Your salesperson's going to learn pretty quickly. They can't sell anything to a user. And so they will see this is not the best use of their time. They're going to start to self-select out and go to other places. And so they'll, they'll see it as non-threatening. So that's another good way to get access. Take sales with you. Just make sure you talk to users. Yep. Um, another opportunity or thing to think about is to 
look at your customers that you have for another product that your company sells and to actually target one of those customers um, if that is a less sensitive area for whatever reason. So you could also say, okay, we've got three or four or five products at this organization or uh, within our company. I'm gonna go see if I could talk to a customer uh, that has this product, but hasn't already purchased this product that I'm re responsible for as a product professional. So that's another angle you could take as well uh, to try to find uh, potentials if that's a barrier. You don't know where to look. Maybe it's hard to get access to them. Start by looking at customers of other products you have and then go there. And of course, you could always buy a list. Right, you can go to. Uh, there's any number of market research firms that allow that will go recruit to a profile. Um, you can pay them, and they'll they'll assemble a list for you. Uh, we put that last because that's our least favorite, um, but it is something that you could do, especially now. You could start kicking up that research so that when we exit this uh, scenario that we're in now, you have a fresh set of people to go talk to. Yep. And Albert, uh, you're absolutely right. You can get a lot of helpful information from your buyer. Uh, I think what Paul was saying is if you've got this resistance from sales, start with users uh, just to try to build that trust and buy-in. But we're not at all suggesting you don't do market research with buyers. That's definitely critical. Yep. All right. How about this challenge around tactical activities? So uh, many of us say, well, I don't have time to do market research or um, I can't do market research because I am buried in all of these tactical execution oriented things. I am busy putting out fires. I'm doing demos, presentations, whatever those things are. Here are a couple of uh, suggestions for you or things to think about. The first one is you could take a look at the pragmatic framework, those 37 activities, and you could divide the labor. It does not have to fall on one person. Those 37 boxes don't mean that they have to be executed on or even owned by product entirely. We can divide the labor up. We can have our marketing teams help. We can have sales or sales enablement. Maybe we've got a pricing team. There's all sorts of people who can participate in actually owning that framework. And that will help free us up, hopefully, uh, some level so that we can focus on studying the market, becoming the expert of the market and getting a really good finger on the pulse. That's right. You can also add new resources, right? That's obviously the toughest, right? Now, uh, nowadays, it's hard to add new resources, especially now many of you are under hiring increases, but that's, uh, that is an opportunity as well. Uh, and then the third way is you could be ruthless in the prioritization of your time. And the operative word there is ruthless. Um, if you find yourself having to take on so much that you can't possibly finish it all, uh, then one example is that in the past I had to essentially put the role of the product owner and product manager under one person. Uh, but what I told him was that he was only the product owner for his product on Monday and Friday. Uh, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, he was product manager. And so on Tuesday through Thursday, I didn't expect to see him in the office. He was doing Nihito. He was doing his Zoom meetings. He was doing other stuff that wasn't related to grooming backlogs and going to stand-ups. Now, now, the engineering team didn't like that a whole lot, but it did work because <clears throat> if you are that ruthless in how you prioritize your time, then you have the ability to get stuff done. If you aren't, then what ends up happening is the most tactful, firefighting, noisiest part of your job dominates and takes over. And pretty soon, all the strategic forward-facing stuff, like what we're talking about here, researching your market, gets laid to the wayside. Uh, and so... You, that is uh, one other solution. You got to be really ruthless. Yeah. And Paul, I just want to echo what you said. Um, I do want to acknowledge though, that it's hard. A lot of us can't just block out every Tuesday or every Thursday. What my product team did was try to ease into it. So we blocked out two hours every Tuesday or Thursday morning. Then we moved it to a four hour block. And then eventually you start to extend that out. Um, people will start to build the discipline and respect that time that you have blocked. You just need to be accountable to yourselves. You need to be accountable for what you're trying to accomplish and stay tr true to that. During these periods of time, I am not going to get distracted. I am going to focus on doing market research related activities. Maybe that's studying data. Maybe that's scheduling appointments. Maybe that's conducting a win-loss interview. Maybe that's analyzing the win-loss interview data you already have, but you're doing something related to market research during those periods of time. And it will, over time, eventually just become part of the culture. Yeah. 
There's actually a fourth uh, potential solution to tactical activities or consuming your time that we didn't put on here. And that's find a new job. Um, but I don't put that on there because that's probably not the best solution. I will warn you that the grass is always greener on the other side. If you look over at that other company and you're like, wow, they do it really well. Then you get over there and find it's the very similar situation. So uh, word of caution, but sometimes that's the best solution. <laughs> um, Albert, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, so would naming your PMs, you know, something with a different title that had the word research in it or whatnot, that could certainly help. Um, I don't know if it'll solve all of our, uh, all of our woes related to this, but something that you've probably realized before or what I saw in my career was um, a lot of people have a different definition of a product manager. And a lot of people define a product manager as somebody who writes requirements, they work with development, they build the technology. And so if you can start to shift that and really help people understand that there are other uh, responsibilities that we have within our role, maybe putting it in a title helps. Um, a lot of that is cultural, right? And you have to, um, I had to literally reposition the entire um, way that our company thought about the product team and what we were empowered to do and what we were responsible for, which can take some time. But once that happens, um, it can make a huge difference. All right, so here's the next one. Oh, I'm sorry. How about you can't get face to face? Obviously, this is incredibly relevant right now where uh, many of us or all of us are under some sort of stay at home order. We're working entirely remotely from our homes and we can't get out of the office, quote unquote, to go get in front of somebody physically. So obviously one of the things we've talked about already several times is to leverage technology. Paul talked about a phone call. That is absolutely better than nothing. Using some sort of software, whether it be WebEx or Zoom or Adobe Connect or whatever it is to get that FaceTime even virtually, you can still leverage the power of observation. It's not 100% when we're on video, but it is absolutely better than not doing it at all. And we can have those interview conversations uh, through that technology. Yeah, totally agree. Um, and I think this is a good opportunity to highlight that there are certain things you can do when you're using tools like Zoom that you can't do, or at least not as easily do when you're face-to-face. -face. Like for example, if I'm doing an Ihito visit with Amy and we're face-to-face, -face, I get to see her native habitat, right? I get to see wherever she lives, where she works. I get to see the way she's laid out her desk and her workflows and all that stuff. You don't get that over Zoom. But what I get over Zoom that I don't get when I'm face-to-face -face is the ability to record her screen. And so if I'm building software, which I know many of you are, and I give her some simple task in a product, like show me how you administer a user, I can now actually ask her to share and record her process. A lot harder to do that when you're face to face because it's, you know, it's a little awkward to, you know, hold your phone over somebody's shoulder and, you know, record them as they, as they go. Yeah. Uh, and so I think this is an opportunity to do something that maybe would be a lot harder to do if you were face to face. And then the last bullet up here that I would encourage you all to think about um, and really take action on is if you can't get face to face with people and maybe there are barriers uh, from a technical perspective, uh, for whatever reason, don't let this time be wasted. Use the time that you have right now, regardless for re uh, research related activities. So affinity mapping, this is the fancy term for having multiple inputs that map to a single problem. Take a look at your data, in other words, that you've already collected information that you already have from the market historically and take a look at it and start to categorize those problems. Start to put them into buckets by likeness and similarities. Um, do persona research. This is a great time to focus on your personas. They are a critical market-driven artifact that affects so many things that we do and none of you should be building to a faceless user. So personas are 100% critical. Spend the time to make sure you've got up-to-date personas. You're doing persona-based research, not just from an, uh, a UX perspective, like how they interact with your technology, because our designers will do a lot of that or we'll do it in uh, collaboration, but research who are they? Um, have they aged in, aged out, anything like that? Spend time doing win-loss interviews. Are you, do you still have sales? Are you winning deals? What are the trends and patterns? Are you losing deals? What are the trends and patterns around that? Start scheduling win-loss interviews for the future. 
and analyze all of those trends. Take this time to look at your data or to start collecting the new data. Uh, let's see, I, we've got a question from Rich. Win loss, what are some successful ways to get sales participation here? Um, Rich, we could probably talk about win loss for a really, really long time. Just initially off the top of my head, um, very quickly, since I know we're running out of time. The thing that I did that shifted the game with getting sales on board was to immediately build a partnership with them and to get their buy-in to have them be part of the win-loss process. So rather than thinking like product was trying to do this to them, it was, uh, hey, here's what win-loss is. Here's what uh, we're trying to accomplish. Here are the types of questions we intend to ask. Do you have suggestions for additional questions? I really tried to pull them in so that they could be part of the process. Um, I didn't necessarily need them to help me create questions. Pragmatic had given me an entire template for it, but that wasn't the point. I wanted them to be comfortable and to understand and to have as much visibility and transparency into what we were doing. So it was important for them to get on board. And it certainly was much more successful that way. I, I would say the number one thing is taking the judgment out of win-loss. Yeah. Win loss is not about judging sales, right? Sales people are one part of the overall process of getting someone to buy something, yep. but they're a small part. You know, so good win loss is not about the sales team. Good win loss is about changing the way we as an organization from marketing and content development through lead generation and through the sales process all the way through after the sale and getting them to be a referral. It's about that entire thing. So how do we as an organization need to change, not just how does the sales team need to change? Once they understand that, it's not just about them. They're a lot more on board. Yep, absolutely. And just before you guys go, Neil, I think also asked a really great question uh, regarding how much prioritization to give items that come up during the HEDO that are more specifically related to the pandemic. And how do you balance that out? Uh, that's a good question. Another one where I feel like we would need to know a lot about your specific um, situation to really answer. But I think the answer there is, is it depends on your industry, your product, where it is in the life cycle, any number of other variables. You know, for many of you, this is going to be, you know, a pretty large, you know, blip on the radar. It's going to go, it'll impact us for a year or two. And then we'll look back five or six years from now and say, wow, that was painful, but uh, I'm still executing on the overall plan that I envisioned before, or, you know, we ultimately went through this. Uh, for others, <clears throat> if you're in the, you know, ventilator, industry. You know, if you're making N95 masks, then obviously this is changing everything you do. Uh, and so you're going to take a lot more um, uh, cues from the market as to what's going on right now. And your challenges are completely different. So I don't want to give a blanket answer to that, but rather to say, step back for a second and think about if you were to zip into the future five years and we're looking back at this, would you say this is one of those sort of events that is changing the entire course of my company and my product or not? And then that'll answer the question for how much um, you need to pay attention to any given piece of feedback right now. And Paul, I actually think that's a really good segue into this last challenge, um, specifically the third bullet. But one of the barriers or challenges or issues um, that many of you commented on, which happens to be our last challenge we'll talk about, is what's appropriate in this time of crisis, in this time of social distancing with COVID happening, um, how can I do market research? Should I still be doing market research? So we believe that doing research is, it may be even more important than now than ever. Um, so just because we're in this really difficult, challenging, weird, not normal time right now, doesn't mean we should put our products on hold. It doesn't mean we should freeze our research efforts. It might be absolutely critical for many of you, as Paul was saying, depending on the industry you're in, the type of products you make, um, it could affect things in ways we never ever anticipated or expected. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, one of the things I always share with executive teams is that the lifeblood of your product team is their ability to drink at the fountain of market knowledge on a continuous basis. And if you stop drinking from that fountain, eventually you're going to go dry. Uh, and so we can't afford to let things go dry. <clears throat> now, you got to be gentle about how you frame these requests for research uh, during this time of crisis. But people want to buy products that solve problems that are relevant to them. And so, yes, even though they're busy right now, yes, even though they're distracted, people are pretty receptive if you go to them with a research request that is framed correctly. So if you go to them and say, hey, 
we're all dealing with the challenges of this right now. We're all humans. I can empathize with you and you with me. Um, part of my job is to make sure that we as an organization are solving the right problems for you and we're solving them in the right way. If we frame up a conversation like that, people stand back for a second and say, okay, this is not a sales engagement. This is something much deeper. And they're trying to be real with me. They're trying to be human. They're trying to solve problems. They're actually doing work on my behalf. And it makes it a lot more of a receptive conversation, even during a, a, a rough time like this, that you can still get yourself into. So I definitely with, recommend not putting things on pause. Yep. Operate with an increased level of sensitivity. Make sure that we're very, very conscious about how we're positioned. And this third bullet on the slide right here, think about what's going on today in our world, what's going on two months from now, how could it impact our distribution strategy? Some of us have to uh, conduct sales in a manner we haven't done before. Some of us might have to allow our buyers to receive our products in a way that they historically have not received them, or they're using them in different ways. Yeah. Um, you all know, I'm sure there are parts of the um, machine that's used to put somebody under anesthesia that's being used for a ventilator. Like we are repurposing different products for different things now. Yeah. Your urgency might change. There could be an incredible sense of urgency right now. Maybe the urgency has stepped back, but it'll pick up again. We have to keep our finger on the pulse of the urgency. We have to look at the impact of our product. We have to look at the volume. Maybe we're going to sell our product in higher volume now, or the quantity is going to shift drastically because of what's happening. Maybe what we do right now during this period of time is going to have a long-term effect on our brand and our reputation in the market. And it's really, really critical that we're doing right up research right now to make sure that we're staying in touch with this. So I think a pretty cool example of all these is 3M right now. So we know that 3M makes those uh, special N95 masks that everybody's trying to get. Normally they were selling through channels, right? They would go through channels to distribute to the hospitals and to the other places that they would sell to. And overnight, all of a sudden everything changed. And now they're engaging in a more direct sales model. Uh, they're selling to the government, they're selling to states directly and so on in ways they've never done before. And so all of these things are being impacted for them immediately. So they're having to shift their entire business. And I hope their product team is a big part of leading that trip. Yep. So I want to address Chris's uh, uh, question here just before we end. Uh, agree that this shouldn't freeze my particular product or business, but what about customers who think their product or business should be frozen? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So let me think about how to answer that. So what I would always tell people is that when they're doing market research, sometimes we have to cast a wide net. Yeah. Um, sometimes the first couple of people we talk to for whatever reason, even not during COVID, uh, they're not able to talk to us. They're busy. They're distracted. They're doing other stuff. So we cast a wider net. Like Amy said earlier, we talk to potentials instead of just customers. We talk to evaluators and we do win loss. So we, we cast the net wider and wider. And the wider you cast the net, the more people fall into it, the more opportunities. It's an at-bats game sometimes, and you have to take more swings to get more hits. And so you might have to take more swings during uh, this quarantine period to get more hits. Um, so it might take a little bit more of your time. If people are not willing to talk to you, you know, don't bash your head against that wall. Uh, instead, okay, fair enough. Move on to the next one uh, until you get a hit. And <clears throat> that might be a little frustrating because you might have to take a lot of swings, uh, but it's worth it because we all know that once you get into that Nihita visit, you start learning things that you didn't otherwise know or confirming things you thought you knew, it's super powerful. Yep. All right, so to wrap up, we pulled together some next steps for you to think about um, some specific action items. The first thing is to set up your interview matrix. So this is a pragmatic template for those of you who have taken class, you've gone through the foundations, you've probably heard about it. However, you can create this spreadsheet um, on your own, but essentially it's going to help you walk through which part of your market segments do you want to hear from? Or think about it, who are you not hearing from? We want to make sure we have a balanced approach. So when Paul and I talk about customers, evaluators, and potentials, is there a group that you're not doing research with? Who do you want to do that with? Set up that interview matrix. In other words, create a plan, uh, set a goal, for the number of Nihito interviews you want to do over the next 30 days. So what does that look like? 5, 10, 15? Are you going to do uh, Zoom meetings or WebEx or, you know, how are you going to do this? What will that look like? And set a specific goal. Uh, go ahead, Paul, if you want to take the last two. 
So yeah, look at your uh, current data. You probably have a lot of data already. Um, and so this is a good opportunity if you can't get access to people that are in your market right now. Well, guess what? You probably have a lot of data sitting around. And that data might not just be from Hito. It could be from things like many of you have analytics within your product. So you can see what people are clicking on and what they're using. Have those trends shifted or changed over the last 30, 60, 90 days? So we can start to do some of that trend analysis for maybe things outside of Nihito to amplify the market research that we're going to put on the plate coming up in the next quarter. Uh, and then finally, schedule your Nihito. Get her done, right? You got you to you, you, you strip away the excuses and you got to just ultimately get it done. Um, one of the ways that I would do this with my product teams in the past was that I've put a quota on my product teams for the number of Nihito visits that I would expect them to execute. And, you know, I, if you ever came to a class that, you know, I taught, I will tell you that uh, the quota that I would put on my team was typically about a dozen. So if you, in other words, if you're a product manager or a product marketer, you're on my team, then about 12 times per quarter, I expect you to get out from behind your desk, either physically or virtually to interact with somebody in your market. Um, <clears throat> that equates to about one market interaction per product manager per week. Uh, which I think is pretty reasonable. You know, if, if you're a product manager and you're not talking to your market at least weekly, it kind of begs the question for me, how are you, how are you doing your job? Um, and so I think it's pretty reasonable. But the point is, whatever the metric is that's right for you, you got to have some sort of interaction with your market. You got to drink at that fountain of market knowledge and you got to do it continuously. So set yourself a goal, execute on that goal a quarter from now, look back and see how you did, see how you can improve. But uh, it was really great to have you all. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you later in the week. Stay safe. Stay healthy.